Hi everyone, thanks for making the time to um, join us today. Uh, I'm going to introduce two important people that will be part of today's conversation. And first of all, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Dino Willocks, who is the Director of Student Employability at the University of Queensland. Dino's work spans professional, academic and extracurricular sp spaces, taking a multidimensional strategic approach to embedding employability across the University of Queensland. Dino is the chair of the Employability Group and member of Student Experience and Stupid, uh, Global Mobility Groups for Under 21, a global network of research intensive universities. Um, Dino, I think it's fair to say you keep yourself fairly busy. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for joining us. Uh, rather than me put in my words what you do from a day to day perspective, do you want to maybe introduce yourself and some of the, the cool? stuff that you're working on. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I work across the University of Queensland working with academics, um, professional staff and students to, to really kind of create a wealth of different enrichment opportunities for students to get involved in, both within the classroom, but also in the co-curricular and extracurricular space. Um, the focus at UQ is really on experiential learning, uh, and that can be in any aspect of your life. Really, what we're trying to do is make sure that um, we offer as many different opportunities to as many different students as possible to engage in as many different places and spaces so in the virtual as well as the physical um, so that they can actually reflect on those experiences and learn from them and really translate that into value so value for themselves for any organization they work with or value in their own institutions or their own organizations if they want to actually become founders so a whole range of different ways of doing that with a whole range of different people in a whole range of different places and spaces it's fun awesome thank you and lots of points to come back to. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to introduce Raju Ganapathy, who is the CEO of Conscience, an education technology company. They partner with the world's leading education and professional publishers, K-12 schools, colleges, universities, associations, test preparation companies, and training companies that teach and assess as a distinctly measurable student outcome. Um, Raju, thank you for joining us. And I'm going to ask you the same question or ask you to also give an overview of, of what you do in a day-to-day -day perspective as well, please. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Sherry. I think uh, it's my pleasure to join this meeting. Uh, just as just to add to what you just uh, what you just mentioned of my uh, you know first level description, uh, I think I'm front and center uh, wherever I have the opportunity to really participate on uh, structural and instructional design methodologies that we undertake uh, in kind of creating these compelling learning experiences. So if we're talking about student experiences uh, in a digital world and more so now in a hybrid world where you have touch points between a high touch classroom environment to a less touch or a no touch experience, which is completely self-paced uh, and on demand. Uh, how are we really focusing on better learning experiences? How do we create sufficient learning hooks? How do we get students coming back for more? Because there is so much out there uh, I think I was listening to the last five minutes of the earlier session that uh, I think Mr. Aditya Gupta was talking about. Uh, and I kind of allude to a lot of those points. There are so many edtech companies in India and globally, and everybody has a solution. But which one is better than the other or which one is more suitable and more appropriate? I focus squarely on the design principles that uh, under underpin uh, the structural sites of these uh, learning dissemination processes as well as obviously the pedagogical, which is either andragogy or uh, pedagogy, of course, in the K-12 and higher ed space. So that's me at a high level. Again, uh, I'm the CEO of uh, Conscience, which is an Indian ed tech company, but we're servicing uh, largely the global markets, the US, the UK, uh, Australia. And of course, all of these companies that we work with have, find, have found themselves uh, an audience in India as well. So by that virtue, uh, we're pretty much, you know, working across uh, continents in, in delivering services. Mm. Awesome, thank you. Um, this is a conversation about student engagement and the one of the interesting points I always find is to actually ask or you know, what's your definition of student engagement or what does that look like for you? Dino, I might put you on the spot and ask for what are the things that you look for? 
Um, I, I think I think one of the things that I always think about is there's, there's always a difference between engagement and interaction. You can engage people by getting them logged on, like we've got 54 people watching us today, but are they really interacting? And so one of the questions for me is how do we make people interact, especially in the virtual space? It's very easy to get people in the physical space to interact and get involved. Um, but engagement and interaction are two different things. And really what you need is data from the systems that you're using to be able to say, well, are people, are they just logged on? Are they engaging? Are they talking to us if we got polls going you know how do we make this an interactive space so it's not just a, a passive reception of information it's really engaging people in in that um it, almost in a kinesthetic way getting them to actually interact with the the the, the technology um, and i think ragu can, can actually speak to to how some of the the design of ed tech can make that happen and cause that to happen and i think there's some really interesting ways that new ed tech is causing that to happen in ways that are actually better than in the physical space so being able to have people working on a a, a virtual whiteboard where they're actually um, engaging in ways where they probably wouldn't in person but they can through the technology so i don't know if you want to speak a little bit to some of those really innovative technology spaces that are better than the physical space yeah no, that's a great one uh, raju over to you how do you yeah. define yeah. engagement absolutely uh, sherry i think I, I would only add to everything that dino, dino has just uh, talked about uh, on, on this opening note which is uh, when we're looking at uh, you know the design process which is again where mm -hmm. i squarely participate uh, I, I would break this down into two parts. One is the structural design, and the other is the content design, because you need for structure to meet with content, especially when you're creating the digital experience. Now, more often than not, or in almost every scenario, you need a platform, which more likely is a learning management system, or it could be something else. But for the most part, it's basically a learning management system, which houses the content delivery experience. So whatever it is you take from an instructional design perspective, whatever methodologies you apply, scientifically you know we heard about micro credentialing we talk about you know basically the learner journey that you conceive as a course designer as a course developer as faculty you need to make sure that the two aspects of the platform which is what i call the structural design mates mm -hmm. with the instructional design that you come up with in your learner journey and of course through that process you have so many touch points yes i also oftentimes say that uh, good quality learning is not and should not be a sit back and watch passive experience, like looking at video headshots uh, preceded by or followed by multiple choice questions. That's not a great <laughs> learning experience. Uh, yes, you may, you may hit check boxes here and there, but is that really going to uh, increase the efficacy? Is that going to retain your students and their knowledge and their interest? Uh, more often than not, we've seen, you know, uh, disappointing, uh, you know, statistics in those areas. So uh, that's the starting. I mean, we focus on looking at structural design. We're looking at how the platforms are conceived. Uh, and I think, uh, Sherry, the real starting point is, and this is a problem, this is a 30,000 feet above the, above the ground. I say that as a problem statement, mindfully, but really, if you look at any good tech product that's there in the ed space, you really need to look under the hood and see that first thing first, which is, have we got the instructional designers or the people that come from the teaching and pedagogical background to really get on the same table, to get on the same page with people who've gone ahead and built the platform? Mm -hmm. So it's getting the it's it's getting the software developers and the learning designers on the same page to conceive your product from step one to step last. The ones who've done it well are the ones who are really reaping the rewards, and this is we're just kind of getting started. So, and, and I think just to pick up on that as well, one of the things that um, Edia uh, talked about in the previous presentation was actually about game-based learning as well. Um, and one of the things there is it's it's really thinking about how to use the, the structure of the technology to engage people and have them interact with each other and actually then link that to the content and link that to the learning that's happening. So the, the structure of the ed tech causes the learning to happen by virtue of that that framework and, and that um, the architecture in behind it. So so you have to have the architecture and the content working symbiotically to actually create something that's new, that's actually more than what you would get if you were in a traditional learning environment. And that's what I'm more excited about really in this space, because you are getting new ways of connecting those things together. And I think the other thing that's really important in that is you have to valorize the, the ability to create that as much as create the content. So to create the structure and the framing and the technology that goes with that is equally as important as the content if you really want this to become a, a truly exceptional educational process. 
Yeah, I'd have to, I completely agree with you on that one. And if I, you know, draw upon a particular experience for open learning, one of the key things that we stand behind is that our learning platform was designed and, and is founded in a learning science, which is social constructivism. So the entire platform is designed with that in mind and our learning design approach is carried throughout. But one of the points of conversations with the, you know, almost 180 education partners that we partner with is often, you know, how do they get started or how do they optimise what the platform enables them to do? And that's not a one size fits all approach. So it's not just, you know, who's the target audience and the delivery mode and that sort of piece, but it's also the consideration when you've worked in a particular learning management system or platform, you know, quite often there's a risk when you change platforms or you test out new platforms that you take the exact same content and use the platform mm. in the same way you've used the previous one. So how do you, you know, vary that? And if I talk about a particular use case for one of our partners, which is iResolves, and they deliver uh, ethics and social justice programs, primarily to K-12 schools, not just in Australia, but globally as well. And they were already, they already had astounding NPS ratings for their face-to-face -face delivery. But one of the pieces for them is they had highly engaging face-to-face -face workshops. So how do you redesign that in an online environment? Mm. And what's been quite cool is that actually the, the concern of losing out that interaction and that interactivity, some of their, their programs are not only more scalable and repeatable now, but in many instances, they're getting NPS um, scores of 90 to 100 for those programs. So with that in mind, I might hand over and ask, you know, with your programs that you run, how did you make that shift to an online environment over the last 18 months? What were your consideration points? Well, the, I mean, the first consideration point, honestly, was get it done quickly. So we, yeah. we transitioned all of our learning to online uh, within a week. So, it, you know, that that speed of, of activity really doesn't necessarily give you the opportunity to, to, to think through how could you make this, that, that thing that I was talking about, that symbiotic relationship between the technology and the content to make it really exciting. But what we have done at the University of Queensland is, is take a students as partners approach. So everything that we've done, we've actually worked with our students to say, okay, what works with you and for you? And how can we actually develop this and co-create something going forward? So the initial switch was just quick and it was a lot of that just lift and drop and lift and drop into an LMS that was there so that we could actually maintain that, that um, the, the learning happening. But really what we then did is said, okay, we know that's not ideal and we know that we need to do better. So let's actually do it with students so that we're working with students, with ed tech companies and um, with third party providers as well to say, well, what kind of, what kind of um, products are there in the market that we can use? And we, and there's a whole wealth of different products that are working, which can be great from the student perspective and from the learner's perspective, because it's very agile. Universities are not necessarily very agile places. So you've always got the issues in the background of connecting the data and connecting the systems and making sure that we're getting from all of those different systems data that actually helps us continue to develop and grow and co-create those learning environments with students. But I think that really has been a, um, a fundamental priority for the university is not assume that we know, neither assume that the student necessarily knows, neither assume that the ed tech company knows, but actually work co co cooperatively together to create something more because again and I think it's one of the things that, that has been very very challenging for academics I would say is all of a sudden they're not the experts they're one expert within an environment or within an ecosystem where we have other experts so we have ed tech people and ed tech companies who can say we're actually the experts in this design space and we've got students going well you know we might be experts in how to use some of this technology because we've grown up with it and we're digital natives and maybe some of our academic haven't got the same experience the same life skills so really recognizing that everyone brings to that environment something unique and something um, valuable and it's the the combination and the, and the kind of collision of all of those things that creates something really new so being open to that possibility and that co-creation I think was really essential in, in in pushing things forward and that's just my experience anyhow at UQ and I'm sure <laughs> with 52,000 students and you know six faculties that there'll be other experiences out there but that's certainly been my experience. Awesome I'm going to throw out to both of you now a question that's come up um, in the chat is 
How do you take into consideration in that design process uh, student access to devices and connectivity in terms of being able to provide reliability in that learning experience? Mm. Uh, yeah, that, that's really interesting because uh, there's also we have um, a lot of our students do work integrated learning in remote, rural and remote areas where the connectivity to the internet is not necessarily great. And um, so making sure that what you're providing is something that can be accessed online. So I, through that, the moment I'm at home and I'm working off a dongle seems to be working OK. But, you know, making sure that people have access to that. But also we have it at the University of Queensland, we have um, uh, laptop loan um, options so students can get access to laptops if they don't have their own things like that but you really do have to think about what do people need and what's the kind of minimum viable product that we can produce that is accessible to as many different people as possible we're not just looking at people on campus we're looking at people at home we're looking at people in rural and remote we were looking at people offshore who are also still you know connecting and, and we've got a lot of students even now who are still studying in country offshore so we've got to make sure that we've considered not only the tech but the bandwidth potential and also time zones so there's a whole bunch of things we need to think about. And do you provide things live as well as um, to, to watch afterwards, as well as hybrid? Yeah, it's trying to balance that is always, always difficult. Yeah, Absolutely. definitely. Um, Raju? Sure, sure, sure Sherry. I, I couldn't agree more with uh, what mm -hmm. Dino just mentioned. If I may just draw in the angle of the design aspect of uh, access to devices, uh, I think uh, again, when we go through a design process of how do you deliver this training and how do you kind of redesign this training uh, for the new tech uh, stack that's available, uh, I think we also look at it from the perspective of which content lends itself best to what type of environment when students actually mm. have to engage with it. So if you go through a learner journey as an example, where you start with, let's say, some amount of teaching content, you have a lot of material uh, to read with pictures, images, visuals, et cetera, and then you start introducing media, uh, media probably as a way of reinforcement. Do you reinforce the learning that, this, that, that you've just given in the last 15 minutes? Uh, some of those pieces can actually be given away for a mobile first environment as against a desktop environment. And it's not a sit back and watch, you know, a read uh, experience even of a printed textbook or a didactic learning experience. This is something that uh, learners can then very quickly. So, I mean, we've been trying this for nearly, I mean, much, much before the pandemic, uh, really for the last 15 years or so. But you can, you can very well see students actually taking some type of formative assessments, even on their mobile phones, when they're in the underground uh, train in New York or London or any other place. And you know you can apply the same even with, with offline access to content. You could do that in other developing uh, countries where the network and co connectivity is not that high as well. So which content lends itself where best in the entire learner journey is one that also needs to be paid attention to when you start at the outset. Uh, just to add to the network and connectivity part that uh, Dino just talked about. Yeah, definitely. And I think it reinforces Dino's point earlier about working collectively through that design process rather than feeling that you have to get it to a certain point before handing it over or being ready to go live. Actually, it can be an iterative process working with a particular partner and students, etc. And, and then how do you use that data for each iteration to improve or feed through for further intakes or cohorts of, of learners that are going through the process as well? And I think, I, I think that just to pick up on that, John, is that, that idea of it, of it being an iterative process, you know, learning itself is an iterative process. Uh, and so I think we've kind of almost through this pandemic, we've become more honest about the fact that we're trying things, we're trying different things and maybe they don't quite work, but OK, let's work together and, and find a better way of doing that. And I think within that, there is there's a, a recognition that what we create within an educational environment is a, a place or a space where really people should be trying things out and being being safe to fail and having that kind of early failures and going okay we'll learn from that and we can do better and and even with the with the within ed tech and within the entrepreneurial space it's, it's really it's part of the course that you try something and it fails and you learn from it and you move on and almost in education there's this this idea that you can't as, as a, a university or as an academic, you can't be seen to fail. And really, we need to get comfortable with that and say, this is actually part of innovation. This is part of creativity. This is just actually what happens. And we have to recognize that sometimes we don't quite get it right. And so we'll learn from that and we'll make it better next time. So that iterative process really needs to be front and center, I think. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's one of the challenges, even myself, having come from a teaching background, background is that sense of I have to have all of the answers and I have to be able to do it all myself. Um, you know, there's the 
the concern or risk in you know in being in an online environment that often comes up is that sense of isolation or that you lose that human connection whereas actually there's the positives that come out of it in that human connection of being able to say this is an iterative process and then the other side is how do you build that community of practice and community of learning so that it isn't you as an academic or a teacher or a facilitator having to be the the sage on the stage the entire way through as well which i guess leads me to the question that's come up and it's one that often um, i get asked as well on not a daily basis but it, pretty much every week is how do you support or guide um, academics or teaching staff through that change process? And um, Raju, I'm going to hand over to you on this one because you have a wealth of experience, not just during the pandemic, but you know, well yeah. before that. So what's your guidance or advice? Sure, I'm going to take a lead from the sage on the stage uh, example that you just cited here, uh, Sherry. I think uh, really, we're kind of just kind of delving deeper into points we've already opened up in the last five minutes, talking through things. Uh, the first thing I think is, again, this if you look at the higher education system globally, Australia, India, US, anywhere, uh, we're talking about hundreds of years of institutional practice to get it to where we are today. Five years. We're looking at brick and mortar. We're looking at, we're looking at physical campuses uh, being built. We're looking at getting students inside the classroom. We're looking at putting the, uh, the facilitator or the faculty in the center of the class and then going about the process of conducting teaching, learning and dissemination. What has happened over 300 years in that format is now question is being quickly questioned, challenged. And I say that respectfully and mindfully here, but that's what we're dealing with in just about now with the new millennials and the new students. It's not about just what do I want to learn? It's also about who can I learn from, which is also a choice now in the hands of the learners. So obviously, when you have these uh, rather evolutionary changes happening under the feet, we really need to look at a redesign process, which uh, alludes to the fact that when content was originally created in the traditional format, which is the high touch classroom environment that we all know, the content was really cre created with the perspective of actually making it more teacher facing, faculty facing, than directly student facing. It's a facilitation process where faculty takes that PowerPoint slide from the overhead projector and uses his or her skills, soft skills, to kind of teach, control the students, and have that interaction in a one-on-one, -on -one, completely 100% high-touch environment. With a lockdown and a pandemic, unfortunately, the world needed a pandemic for that uh, to, to kind of talk about the change of scenario. But that has all changed right now. We are the, the position in the triangle, as I like to call it, you have the student, you have the learner, and you have the content. And the position of these three pivotal points has rapidly changed in just about a few years and more so in the last 18 months. So to answer your question, I think once again, I would say it's about an overhaul of the content design process such that you make that content not teacher facing, but directly student facing. And it's easier said than done. That's a huge transformational processes, a process. And for the ones who understood it, uh, have done it well, have really, st have really started to see the rewards uh, uh, already in, in so many years, and we've, we've seen some of that very closely. So, uh, and you talked about this again, that's where I, I oftentimes say that the what of the teaching, you know, if you ask me, is the prerogative of the subject matter expert because he or she knows what it is they're teaching, you know, they're talking about uh, in any subject area. But the how to of that teaching is where you can get the handy help of seasoned instructional, good quality instructional designers because they, they do not understand the content, uh, the what, the subject matter, but they definitely can help with how you can take this you know, to the last mile in terms of the design process, in terms of the dissemination process. So that is the first phase. I mean, so it is about really taking that content and making it from a didactic uh, teacher-facing experience to making it more directly student-facing. And in that, you can bring in all those things. Like, I mean, uh, just, uh, just a few minutes ago, Dino talked about creating scenario-based experiences. Uh, where it's perfectly fine to fail in. That is what you need. You want students to go through a process where it's not always a one way of getting enlightened at the end of it. You have to make your uh, make uh, mistakes. You have to fail before you come back on the on the right path. So using media, using interactive videos, again, in a video experience like this, it should be an environment where if it's a role play, if it's a dialogue, if it's a scenario-based learning experience, um, 
you could create that using animations, graphics, illustrations, or you can even put up a headshot of a key opinion leader for a five minute video. But you do not have to run that video for five minutes and students are then you know, going off to their WhatsApp messaging. You can actually intervene the five minute video with cue points where you're actually allowing learners to participate. I'll just give that as one example, but that's a classic interactive video experience in a, in a good quality course. So it's about bringing in those touch points. So on the other extreme, you can create simulations, you know, a physics, biology, lab simulation. Let's take a gram stain. It's a 37 step process of how you do a stain and how you find, find the results. Yeah. And students have to do that. And that's the other, I mean, that's an extreme form of creating simulations with rich media interactions. But even a basic one could be taking a five minute video headshot of a faculty, a key opinion leader, but not letting it play on its own, but getting those interactions, allowing for objections, and probably even look at reme looking at remediation pathways. So you're actually taking them into different parts and kind of gating them out. So I'm going in a different direction and another student is going off in a, direct, in a different direction from a key intersection gateway point. Yeah, great. Those are some of my thoughts, Sherry. Um, Dino, do you have any guidance or tips no. as to how you approached it? Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with everything that, that Raji said, and I, I think the, the thing is, it's that it's the it's the what and the how. And I think in in bringing those two things together, the critical thing for me is have students involved in those conversations as well, because that really gives you the why. <laughs> why are you doing this? So yeah. there's a there's a, an element there about why do the student why do the students want to know this, and how can we make it better for them? But is it working? And get that feedback. So getting real time feedback, and that comes back to the data again, and that that very first question about you know the engagement and interaction getting that from the students and making sure that that's feeding all the time the co-creation and the continued development of that learning environment because that's how you're going to make it work definitely and I think the the piece that ties that all together is that how does this all align to the learning outcomes that we started out mm -hmm. with the intention of delivering and being able to to demonstrate against as well uh, and I think reflection and building in reflection opportunities not just for the learners but for the the learning design staff and the academic staff is a key part of that process. Mm -hmm. um, I could keep talking for hours, but we're running out of time very quickly. So if I can ask uh, Dino, do you have, you know, two or three key mm -hmm. takeaways from a student engagement perspective to leave everyone with today? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, the virtual and the physical spaces and places for learning provide different opportunities, but they actually need to be connected to have maximum effect. So you can't just be virtual or just be physical. You're going to have to somehow bring those together and thinking about collaboration and creating synergies between all of the people involved in that. The human connection is fundamentally important and that human connection be, can be facilitated in a virtual environment. But ultimately, we need to make sure that that connection is two way, that we're listening as well as speaking and that we're actually designing designing things that engage people and get them to interact. It's not just a, a didactic one way uh, thing. The, I, I did get asked before we started this, what would your one takeaway be? And I, I wanna leave you with a quote, I studied philosophy originally. The only constant in life is change. That's from Heraclitus, born in 540 BCE. So we're still in that place now. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is changing yeah. still, and we need to embrace that change and, in, and enjoy it. Amazing. Thank you so much for your contribution and your time today. Raju, what would be your, your takeaways? Sure, Sherry. I think, uh, again, I think I would allude to the fact that uh, everything that we do here in terms of design and experience also has to be one that's actionable and data driven, which I think was uh, a point that you kind of led into in the, the first part. So uh, that is a very important piece, uh, you know, actionable insights, getting actionable insights from anything that you that you do, especially in an iterative process, you have version one, and then you end up with a version five over, over a period of time, we need to be able to uh, get the right type of actionable insights. And we need to design that effectively for all stakeholders in the system. So if it's a learner, I mean, as a student, and th these are some other things that coincidentally we're working on very closely at this moment, uh, even in the form of a product. But as a student, what do I need to see? I need to see how am I doing? What is my, what is my progress in a course? If I have a 12 week course or a 20 week course, how far along have I gone? What activities have I taken? What is still in progress? What is completed? What are the mandatory activities? I need to be able to get all of this data. If you talk about student engagement, they need to be again hooked to their experience, whether it's physical or whether it's digital. So looking at some of these parameters like uh, my progress in the course, my pace, my, uh, I would say the pace is the equivalent of your heart rate when you step up, step up on a treadmill. 
uh, if I have 300 students in my peer group, how am I doing up, up, up against the others? So uh, the pace indicator is a vital uh, indicator. And of course, finally, the performance, which again is looking at formative, summative, and really how have I done in this course? How do I look at my assessments? Uh, how have I scored and how do I go to my remediation? All of this vested with a good interaction with a student success manager or a director of student success. If you have that through a learner journey, uh, will call for a nice compelling experience. I can see that people are looking at the watch and I think, that's <laughs> I think David's popped back up. So that's the, the final wrap up. It's your cue. Well, yeah, your when cue David turns up, that's where we have to go. <laughs> as soon as I start hearing researchers and academics quoting the philosopher who created a saying that we use every single day from 1545 BC, is that right? Did I get the date uh, right? Uh, 540 BCE. 540, yeah. 540, 540 BC. There we go. There, then I, I realize it's time for me to come back to bring the conversation back to edge growth normal so thank you yeah. uh, Roger. thank you dina and thank you sheree for an amazing conversation about engaging students in the digital world thank you very much pleasure as always thank you my pleasure thank you um, which gives us an opportunity now to welcome Margot Griffith to the stage, who is from Edelex. Margot leads growth at Edelex, which is uh, Edelex is an Australian edtech platform that is doing amazing things around micro credentialing and supporting learners and showing the evidence of that work. But Margot has been in the higher education space for a very long time. Um, we won't put numbers on things, Margot. We'll just say that you are well known to our audience and you have got a long career here. So I'll hand over the stage to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, very excited to be here. And I appreciate you not um, dating me with the number of years I've been in the education um, market here in, in Australia. Um, so yes, super excited to be here to talk about assessment um, and opportunities in assessment, but also innovative assessment models. Um, and I'm going to be joined by um, two wonderful people, um, the first of which is Professor Adam Bridgman. Uh, welcome, Adam. Thank so you. Adam is, uh, or has, according to my um, piece of paper here, decades of experience as well um, <laughs> as an educator. And he's also has been uh, the Pro Vice Chancellor for Educational Innovation in the Education Portfolio since 2018 at the University of Sydney. Uh, with a focus on using electronic resources in chemical education, Adam has specialised in the effectiveness of electronic resources for enhancing education, including the use of simulations, calculators and games on the web and on mobile phones. Adam holds a PhD in inorganic chemistry from Trinity Hall in Cambridge. Welcome, Adam. Thanks, Margot. Um, and I will introduce um, our other colleague here, um, Nimish Chowdhury. Nimish is the current Vice President of International Business at Webox, an IT company that offers technical assistance to aid seamless pedagogy. Webox <laughs> provides proctored AI Oh, sorry, Proctored, AI-driven, um, safe, secure, and scalable assessment, and also LMS solutions. Namish received an MIM from, of management at Charles Darwin University, and also has a Master of Arts from Chowdhury Charan Singh University. So welcome, Namish. Thank you both for, for joining today. Thank you, Thank you. Um, I would like to, we've only got 30 minutes today, so um, I guess we'll jump right in. Um, if I can throw to you, Adam, please. Um, we are, as I mentioned, talking about um, innovation and innovative models in assessment. Um, hoping you can share with us, um, I guess, the pandemic and also post-pandemic plans uh, for assessment at the University of Sydney for your 70,000 students. Thanks, Margot. Yeah, 70,000 students, about 4,000, 5,000 staff who are research focused. Um, uh, We've been thinking about changing assessment for years. Um, suddenly last April, everything went online. So obviously we started having to really uh, rethink our assessment very quickly and um, getting through last year. And we're now planning for what is gonna be uh, next year and what's gonna be the new normal, which is definitely gonna be um, much more online than we ever would have planned, um, but making the best of, of online and face-to-face. -face. So that's the, that's the challenge. I've spent the last 14 months trying to get online assessment to actually work at scale. And now we're thinking about what that's going to look like in the future. Yeah, there's some huge challenges there. Um, Nimish, um, wonder if you'd be able to, to share with us around, um, I guess, the education environment um, within India. We know the, the, the COVID from afar, 
Um, but what did that mean for education in particular? What did it mean for assessment um, in India? See, Margot, there were uh, abundant challenges which were there in terms of how do we assess people, especially with about 1.35 billion people. And um, in, in, in universities, as Adam said, there are about 70,000 students. In our universities, we close to have about two, two and a half, uh, 100,000 students which actually appear for assessments. And managing that kind of a crowd and managing that kind of a, a scalability which was there was kind of missing. And that is one of the biggest challenges the entire economy faced, the entire education fraternity faced. Mm. And I, I think since we've been operational for the last 11 years in India, we had some uh, large ideas as to how to how to plug in and fit in the model where we can offer an AI driven remote proctor customized customizable assessment solutions. And we I think we kind of seeped in into that change which was forced upon us. And and as somebody said, the change is inevitable. That's the only thing which is actually constant and permanent. And with our, with our 11 years of experience, we realized that this is the time probably where we'll have to innovate more because by the time we were sitting in 2018, 19, we thought that we had invented and reinvented the wheel. But by the time we came to mid 2020, we realized there are a whole bunch of new requirements which have suddenly mushroomed up and we didn't know how to address them. And probably today sitting in 2021, we as VBOX believe that we'll take another three to four years to innovate more to address what, what are the requirements in terms of the industry's expectations. Maybe be it the education fraternity or the corporate fraternity. Yeah, it, it's um, there are many challenges and I, I'm understating that completely um, around the move to online assessment. Um, Adam, would you care to um, outline some of those challenges I'm sure you're facing as we speak? So those challenges, are, I think, are part in the way that we, we have assessed. We've as, tended to assess knowledge and mm. assessing knowledge is just unsuitable uh, for, for somebody that's got access from home to the to the web. But that's telling us something. That's telling us that that, that assessment was probably pretty um, not fit for the modern world anyway, because the Google is search engines are just there and available. And so why would we restrict our students from them? Um, doing this on a scale is, is, is a massive problem and ensuring integrity is a, is a really big problem. And so when we're rethinking assessment for the modern world, it has to be uh, assessment for learning to make sure that we're assessing the things that we want that are valuable to students and valuable to their employers in the future and valuable to us for giving them rich feedback, not um, not not simply yes, this is correct or incorrect. Um, it's, and it's those skills that they'll need, that students will need, that we need to assess. And doing that online is obviously a huge challenge. And some things you probably don't want to do that way because. Um, you don't want you don't want your surgeons necessarily to to be assessed um, in a VR model for forever. You want them to actually have done that on a, on a patient mm. at some point. And so there's lots of challenges. Um, students crave feedback. We know across the world that that's something that we do really badly, and that the University of Sydney is certainly no exception to that. So how can we improve feedback? Um, and I did like at the end of the last talk um, where Dino was talking about um, the importance of failure. I think that assessments where students can get feedback and act on that feedback and that feedback helps them to improve and have high, uh, um, uh, have high expectations of the students that they will fail. Life's about failure and learning from failures and feedback is about doing that. So those are, those are some of the challenges that, we've, that we face. Yeah, that's so important, isn't it? That the the personalization, I guess, of, of, of that feedback to that's specific to the individual's requirements. Uh, Nimesh, from a technology perspective, um, how you how do you feel that technology enables or supports um, some of the challenges that um, Adam had highlighted? Margot, see, every challenge we believe is a source for opportunity. I mean, uh, the moment we have something which is actually bottling us up we realize there is image there is tremendous potential where we can explore the entire opportunity we have and turn it into an advantage a technical uh, technological advantage which will serve mankind i mean with about trillions and trillions of brain cells that we have eventually technology will be only an assistance to mankind it, 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 it's it's a very strong uh, a misbelief that technology might overcome someday but then we will be the masters for the entire technology Absolutely, I agree with that. The challenges are in terms of security. So how do we make sure that, that the entire platform is safe, it is secure? There is no data pilferage. And I, I reckon with different 
continents and with different countries having their own standards in terms of maintaining security. I mean, if I look at Australia, there is an Australia uh, 1918 Pri Privacy Act. In when you when you come to Europe, there is a, there is a GDPR protocol. Then there are ISO certifications. So there are a whole bunch of uh, security issues which need to be addressed, which needs to be incorporated. That gives us the opportunity to offer a wholesome, holistic solution where we can come down to our clients and tell them, see, guys, guys, this is what we are able to offer you in terms of security, in, in, in terms of your data, in, in terms of data privacy. I'll just give you one small quote. A couple of uh, months back, we had one client who said, all is fine, but I still do not want to share my students' details. Well, we said, well, that that's quite an challenge we have but after a few deliberations we we just gave him a solution okay what you do is you give me a 10 digit code allocated to every every of a student i do not need the entire details or nuances of that particular person and we'll be able to execute a test and that's exactly what we did so the second uh, challenge which i believe is the scalability issue if, if you're talking about a couple of hundred, uh, I guess that's manageable. A thousand, that's a little difficult. But when you come to about um, uh, hundred, uh, hundreds and thousands of students being conducted at the same time and having that scalability, uh, this uh, February, March 2021, we came across a challenge where we were supposed to address assessment to one million students in a span of eight days. So that was like conducting wow. 150,000 examinations every day, seamlessly, flawlessly. And that was... That actually gave us shivers. But by the time we sail through that process, we realize we can do it because we've done it. It's just a matter of scalability. So that's that exactly what we did. And the third challenge was, is about customization in terms of how do you support what exactly is the requirement. Mm -hmm. And today, uh, I think, as I said, by 2018, 19, we realized we've achieved everything. But today we, we, we realized we've, start, we've just started to walk. There's a long way that we need to go and achieve in terms of the solutions that we offer to our clients across the globe. Mm. Yes, I don't think we really have real understanding of the sheer scope of the numbers that you're dealing with in India mm. and, um, you know, with the, the kind of high stakes exams that you would be conducting as well, that, that security is just, you know, simply, um, you know, it, it's everything. Um, it's actually of paramount importance. I mean, today that's yeah. that's that's the that's the first crux that we talk about. Mm, mm, absolutely. Um, can we talk about a little bit how things are shifting? Um, because you know there is a new normal out there. Um, there is a recognition that authentic assessment, um, personalization in in the assessment and the feedback. Um, you know, Adam, how do you feel that the that, that assessment strategies are changing? And there's a kind of a two part to this too. What will it take from a professional development perspective to enable that to happen as well? Because we know that there has to be a shift and lift with, you know, the academics themselves. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. So the, I think, as I said earlier, the, the fact that you can't just assess knowledge or it's very hard to assess knowledge um, and, and why would you in the online environment um, means that we do have to shift our assessments and and clearly employers are telling us that they want students to have certain skills and those mm. skills aren't all about writing an academic essay or learning the elements of the periodic table they're much richer skills they're much more uh, about their their their, um, their thinking and their and their understanding rather than just their ability to memorize and so that is a real shift um, we also need students, of course, who are able to work in a, in a multimedia in, in, and so multimodal assessments, which of course is so much better suited to the online environment than it is to an examination hall. It's something that the online environment really provides um, in much richer ways than, 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 than we had before. So taking hold of that and, and bringing those two things together to make assessments that are authentic. But to come back to your, your, your point at the end there, absolutely, that it's a real struggle because people um, my academics and my, one of my roles is to is to improve the teaching of the academics are absolutely success stories of um, ex assessment systems where memorization um, and cramming uh, were the were the main thing. So getting them to the mind shift uh, to, to to think that they have to should assess in a different ways, and then to give them to, the skills uh, to, to to do that um, is is a real challenge. It's something that I spend. Um, 
many hours every week uh, on. Um, and although we're getting somewhere, we're getting somewhere quite slowly because, just because of the sheer volume of change, to go back to that word again, the sheer volume of change and work that's, that's, that's required at the moment, it's, it's, it is something that's, that's, that's pretty difficult to fit into everybody's working day, but it is something that has to be done if we're gonna make this, this, this next jump away from sort of emergency online assessment to, to something. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It um, it strikes me, and if I'm just going to pick up on, on one of the things that you said earlier um, around, I guess, assessing non-domain specific skills. Um, I, I'm from where I sit and, and the work that we do at Edelex, um, it's really around discovering and surfacing, you know, the, the workplace skills. Um, from your perspective, you know, you know, I think during the pandemic, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, there was, and, and it was achieved, you know, the move to online um, and an assessment of those domain-specific skills. But, but how are you going to tackle, you know, these employability skills, these soft skills, these transferable skills? How are you going to tackle assessing those? And like, is there a way to tackle it at scale? Um, I, I'd love your thoughts. And Namish, I'll, I'll, I'll get yours next. Yeah, and I think I think it is possible. I think the scale is a, is a problem, as, as as I said. Also, the background and the skills of the academics is a problem. Just thinking, just looking at one of the uh, the questions in the chat is, academics aren't great at giving feedback. Yeah. Um, don't want to spend too much time giving feedback, and they consider the feedback that they give to be good enough. Whereas a lot of students want something much richer, and, and so it, it is possible. I think we just need to place ourselves in the as ever in the students shoes mm -hmm. think about the journey that they're going on the challenges that they face and the kind of employers the kind of skills that the employers will want and then shift our assessments to do that and it might be portfolios it might be it might be micro credentials it might be small skills that they pick up along the way to personalize that 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 journey for them but also uh, making sure that those assessments are authentic to um to to where they're going to the profession that they're being trained for Nimish, what's your thoughts on that? And, and you know, that uh, assessing domain-specific skills and also assessing those employability skills, what's your thoughts on that, particularly with reference to the Indian environment? Uh, Margo, just adding on to what Adam said and probably pinpointing the two main challenges that every faculty member faces, because I've witnessed my mother being as a teacher, See, every faculty member has about 300, 400 students to cater to. And mm -hmm. presuming that it takes about 10 days, 15 days to complete one chapter, the biggest challenge is that how do you judiciously actually assess every student in terms of their learning and in terms of their uh, outcome of the, the, of, of the deliveries? So the only chalk and talk way was that you make them undergo a paper and pen uh, examination mode. You assess every copy. That means if there are 300 students, you are looking at about 3,000 man hours being spent into assessing those 300 students, which is about roughly, I think, 45, 50 hours of human labor going into it. So that was one challenge. So the second challenge is that how do you actually come to the point where you judiciously realize that this particular student or this group of students did not understand topic A or topic B or topic C of a particular chapter? Because I know what you've learned. But then how do you compute the fact that, okay, out of the seven topics that are there in a particular chapter, these three topics, two topics were not understood or learned by this segment. So these are the two main challenges. Now, as far as uh, coming as to the soft skills are concerned, uh, I think we, we have one product which is kind of based on John Holland's uh, uh, psychometric assessment, which is the Barrow test. So there have, will have to be innovation. There will have to be new emergences of the techniques that you would involve. It could be technologically aided. It could be a psychometric based. It could be personality based. So there will have to be ways which will have to be evolved which will have to be matured enough to make sure that we are able to deliver and we are able to offer a wholesome solution where these things can be taken into account. Uh, just last Friday, we were actually deliberating and our CEO kind of launched a couple of initiatives and the first one of one of the first uh, new uh, uh, product feature we launched is called as a watermark. Now see, the challenge is that how do you ensure that the examination paper, which especially in case of high stake examinations, how do you ensure that that is not leaked or that is not passed on to a particular process? 
So what we've innovated now is we've called something as a watermark. So the moment I pass on this question paper to somebody else, the I can the V box can actually locate and and find the path where it was leaked to. So that was another challenge which came to us. That how do you ensure that the examination paper which I'm giving on online does not get leaks and passed on to the other students? So there are challenges absolutely and. As I said, challenges uh, help you with opportunities, and that's what will have to be taken into account. Yeah, that's really interesting, and, and thank you, Nimesh. Um, Adam, we've touched on before um, this notion around authentic assessment, um, and we've also been talking a lot about scale in this conversation here. Obviously, things like multiple choice questions um, are economies of scale. That, that's the way things have been done and the way that things will probably it will be part of the, the, the assessment arsenal into the future. Um, what are your thoughts around, um, I guess, authentic assessment? Can multiple choice questions be authentic? Or what does it mean to you around what do you what would you define as authentic assessment? I think authentic assessment is about problem solving that's that's um, um, authentic to the of the, it means something in that discipline area. I, do I believe mm. in multiple choice questions? I, I find myself not doing um, as much anymore as I used to. Mm. Uh, it's really difficult. I think it's actually more time consuming to write good exact, good MCQ questions. So though you save time on the marking, um, you have to refresh them because um, you have to assume that they're out there, I think. Mm. And so writing a good exam, good, going a good MCQ is certainly possible, but it's, it's very challenging. And, and I think in most cases, it's actually easier perhaps to write a, a scenario um, that requires maybe a few multiple choice questions and, and a short answer um, just to just to justify the, the, the approach that the student's doing. So I, I, MCQs are wonderful for formative um, purposes. They're wonderful for giving rich feedback to the student and giving rich feedback to the teacher. Mm. Um, um, but for summative assessments, I, I find them harder to, to justify. Um, and so we said, and I think the workload that they used to save is not so, is maybe maybe not, is not the key thing it used to be. Authentic assessment is, we don't tend to in our lives have MCQs. We tend to have things which are much more nuanced. We don't have the right answer in front of us to choose from. Sometimes we have to, we have to, we have to work it out without the answer. It's not a, who wants to be a millionaire? It's, it's much more about um, um, thinking about the answer without knowing, without being given those clues. Formative, yes, summative, I'm not so sure. Yeah, that's, it's really interesting. So how would you do that online? How would you do performance-based assessments online? Like I think um, the scale is the, obviously the difficult thing. Um, I think that um, I don't necessarily believe that the traditional exam is the way that we should we should sit. I think we should, we should, we've got to have these assessments which are staged, which have multiple points for feedback, multiple points for the student to build on their understanding, and I think that also helps to to build integrity into the assessments because it's much easier to see that you're dealing with the same student consistently. Mm -hmm. um, but doing it at scale is definitely a problem. Uh, maybe some combination of, of, of online assessment with oral exams, for example, is is, is important. Um, yeah. But that again is, is comes down to, to scale is always a, a difficult thing. Thanks, Adam. Yeah. Mark, we, just cutting uh, short. Uh, my 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 apologies. Authentication. What Adam said is also right. But then there are another two components to it. The first component is how do you authenticate the person who's coming to appear for that examination? That's one one other challenge. So I, I might be a bona fide student, but how do I ensure that it's me who's actually coming on the platform to appear? And second, uh, second, third rather would be that how do you authenticate the entire flow and process during which the examination has been taken in, in, in into process? So these are another two challenges. These are another two process of authentication that need to be driven. Over to you, please. Yeah, no, 100 percent. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we need to wrap up, so I would really love it if you could give the three key takeaways, I think, in terms of either assessments um, in a digital environment um, or where you would like to see um, assessments in a digital environment go. Um, Namish, if you can you know, quickly tell us. Uh, Margot, see, again, as I said, the first part is the security and the scalability. That's something which is uncompromisable. That is something which, which is of paramount importance. 
with the paradigm shift that we've seen, uh, I think there's still a lot of long way and a lot of innovation that needs to be incorporated in terms of technology and in terms of what solutions we bring on the platform. That there still are, I think, a few uh, parameters which need to be addressed in, in terms of security, in terms of a cheat proof examination being uh, conducted, in terms of the associations that you form within the uh, peer peer groups, which, which definitely is missing from the conventional classroom. And the third challenge and the third takeaway is that how do we ensure that we have a very strong customizable solution, which because every every person, every client would have a different need. And so our challenges are to what extent can we help customize the solution that we, that we require and probably help you with those solutions. That's our key mottos and that's the key um, parameters that we have. Thanks, Nimesh. Appreciate that. Adam, your, your three key takeaways around assessment. Thanks, Marco. So I think, um, first of all, don't try to replicate what worked in the face-to-face -face environment. Use the uh, for formative and summative purposes, use the best things that the online environment can give you. Secondly, mm -hmm. that means um, use it as an opportunity for richer, for multimedia, uh, multimodal assessment and, and more authentic assessment too. And thirdly, I think we haven't really touched on students' concerns around privacy, but try to explain, you have to explain to students the benefits in, the flexibility, um, getting them through their degrees in a pandemic, but also the flexibility and, and the richness of the assessment. And I think then everybody's responsibility, the students and the staff's responsibility and, um, and, and um, integrity being as beneficial for the students as it is for the staff. And that's why it's important. Mm. Oh, and look at that. Here's David. Yeah, that. <laughs> look at that, right on time as well. So Adam, um, Nimish, Margot, thank you so very much for giving us some insights into assessment in the digital world. And there's no doubt that this hybrid and online education environment is not going away anytime soon. So it's uh, exciting to hear that we've got some deep people, some people thinking deeply about what the future looks like. So thank you very much.